Oh, okay. Thank you. Good. Right, it's okay. We're just checking my microphone that it was working. Okay, carrying on from here. Now, what we're looking at, Unit 304. Now, remember, there are a number of sessions to the Unit 304. And we are now on Session 7, Protective Devices and Discrimination. Okay? Let me just pan back a bit so you can see it in full. Okay, now go in a little bit and lift up so we can get that in full. Okay? Now I don't need to read this to you because you can read it for yourselves. Okay. And here we are. And uh, again, similar to what you should have seen already in quite a number of the videos. And here we are in regards to the let's go up, session seven, okay. Protective devices and discrimination, okay. You should be able to get that in full. Okay, thank you. And I'll just pan back so we can get it full screen. Okay. And here we have the learning learning outcomes for this session, okay? The students will be able to gain an understanding of protective devices, gain an understanding of discrimination and coordination. Okay. Okay, protective devices. Let me just pan back a bit. Right, let me go in first so we can get a good view of these protective devices. And here you can see your fuses, your circuit breakers, okay, and your RCDs, photo RCDs, I should say. Now, protective devices is the name given to a wide variety of electrical components, from the common fuse to the more complex devices such as circuit breakers. Protective devices are installed to protect the installation from short circuits and overloads. They are not there to stop people getting an electric shock, nor are they there in case anything goes wrong by making the fuse blow. It is important to know the difference between an overload and a short circuit. Protective devices Protective devices have a breaking capacity. This is the maximum fault count that they have, that the device is capable of carrying before it causes damage to the device. Okay, let me just go up so you can get this in and read this for yourself in full. Or pan in, okay. Okay. 
Okay, let's go down. Okay, panning back. That should be good. Okay, pan back a bit. Make sure we get everything in in frame. Okay. Thank you. And if you heard me in the last video, in the last slide I apologize it's okay I was just thinking I was just talking to somebody there quietly but um so I guess in my phone was on so I apologize for that okay let's go down a little bit make sure we can get that in the shot over current protection Now, protective devices are installed to protect the installation from short circuits and overload and as part of the protective measures ADS to limit the risk associated with electric shock. Protective devices usually operate on one of two principles, heat. Either the device gets hot and melts or opens a bimetal contact magnetic with an increase in current there is an increase in the magnetic field this increase is detected and operates a switch excuse me let me just make sure we get this in for you to read in full okay okay thank you okay Let me go to the end. Okay, thank you. Let me make sure that it comes in. Pan in and make sure that we okay have it in full view. Okay, thank you. Okay. Definition used. But rated current, this is the maximum current that a protective device will carry indefinitely without the device operating or being damaged. Fusing current, this is the minimum current that will cause a protective device to operate. Then we need looking at fusing factor. This is the ratio of fusing current to current rating. And you can see the fusion factor equal fusion current over current rating. And let me just make sure we can get that into play for you in full. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay, good. Thank you.
Okay, short circuits. Okay. Okay. Oh, crap it. Okay, sorry about that. Um, okay, something just popped in around again. Right, sorry about that. Um, BS7671 states that a short circuit is an overcount resulting from a fault of negligible impedance between live conductors having a difference in potential on the normal operating conditions. Okay. Okay. Now, the short circuit is a fault and will result in a large flow of current in the circuit. Here's your line. Protective device, fuse. Okay. Short circuit happening here. Now remember your fault, earth fault loop circuit okay this is just telling you a simplified version of it you can see that at the load a short circuit has developed given a direct connection between the two live conductors with a short circuit there is very little resistance involved okay just come back make sure we can get this all, all in okay Sorry about that, I can't keep drifting off to the discussion. Okay, let's just go in closer so we can make sure we have everything in play. We go to a diagram, okay. Okay, so make sure that we can read, the text can be read, okay. Thank you. Okay, turning back. Thank you. With a short circuit, there's very little resistance involved. Okay, and up and back. I'm just panning it in. Okay. Okay, thank you. Now overload, and here you are, overload, okay? An overload current in a circuit which is electrically sound. Now an overload is not a fault, a circuit may be sound, however the loads or appliances connected to the circuit may demand more current than has been allowed for in the circuit. Now, and let me just go up a little bit, make sure we get everything in, okay? Okay, and here we have, have a call day in the office, okay? And here we have a number of appliances all switched on, electric fire, computer, printer, uh, printers again and again look at this these would be radial circuits okay but remember that all this is a radial circuit even if it was a ring main it is still not advisable to overload any one particular socket outlet okay that will still cause your problem okay so remember that please and bear that, that in mind. It matters. Over, overloading of devices is not recommended. Now you can see in my own situation here, let me just go a little bit, make sure we get all of this in. I'm just going a little bit some more so we can pick this up. Okay.
Now, hand back a bit. Okay. Now, again, in my situation here, and I'm just going to show you my own situation of overloading. Okay. All right. And here we are. Now, these sockets here is a two-way ex extension. Okay, additional bit. And all this is is that because I'm not, not I don't need to worry because all these feeding is a printer, uh, my computer, uh, a lamp, and the printer. And the total power here is only maybe 300 watts all together coming from these sockets. That's why it is important that you keep your overload situations as low demand as possible. And here's the lamp that I'm talking about, just the glowing in the dark, okay? And it's spread from here. So I don't need to worry because I know that my current demand here is very low and that I'm not in a risk of overloading my socket outlet. Okay, thank you. I think let's make sure that we are in frame. Okay, good. Thank you, excellent. And here we have types of protective devices. Okay, excuse me. Now, the range we will look at are BS3036 semi enclosed revival fuses, BS1361 now super sealed, and BS1362 cartridge fuses. BS88 HRC, a high rupture capacity or high break capacity fuses and circuit breakers to BSEN 60898. Now the choice of a protective device depends on many factors such as the type of system, the earthen arrangements, cost and designer choice. Now, let me just go in and make sure that we can get all of this in, okay? And it's easy for you to read, all in well, hopefully. Okay. I'll turn back out. Good, thank you. And here we have breaking capacity, okay? Now, breaking capacity. The breaking capacity is the amount of prospective fault current that a device can safely disconnect without dangerously operating. Go beyond the breaking capacity and damage can be done to the contacts in such a way that an explosion can occur. When choosing a protective device, the designer needs to consider the coordination of the protective devices discrimination and the earth loop impedance now the protective device must operate within the required time and you will remember we did that back in session six while still not causing the protective conductor to be damaged by too large an increase in conductor temperature 
Okay, let me just go back down a little bit to make sure we can get it all in. Yeah. Okay, and I'm just going to pan in so you can see it for yourself and read it accordingly to your ledger. Now the adiabatic equation. Now we did this in session six, but remember we were looking for the k values then. Okay. Now let me just go up, make sure that we can get this in the light. Adiabatic equations. Okay. Let's just make sure we can get this red. Make sure everything is red, it's there, clear, and in good light. Okay, good. The adiabatic equation deal with the relationship between the amount of energy being absorbed by the cable during the fault which causes the cable to heat now you remember we were talking about thermal thermal losses in session six look back at session session six to see what we were talking about to recap okay and the loss of the same energy by the cable so that damage by overheating does not take place okay now the first equation relates to chapter 43 of bs 7671 and again confirm that it is still the same chapter in the 18th edition and any future editions that comes up and the time taken for the conductors to rise from the initial operating temperature to the final limiting temperature okay now here this is our formula here okay now pan back a bit so we can get it all in okay We are dealing with here with the default currents rather than overloads. We are making sure that as the fault current flows, the insulation will not melt before the protective device has a ch had chance to operate. So in this case here, we are looking to, we need to be sure that whether you have a thousand amps flowing as a fault current, that that protective device will operate before the cable begins to even get warm or melt okay and that is the aim of this adiabatic equations <laughs> sorry I'll, I'll, i will learn it one day one day i will okay so let me just bring this in so that you can see this for yourself in large as close as possible okay Okay, and I'll come back.
and again we have the continuation of the adiabatic equation okay and I'll just put that there for you to make sure that we can pick it up okay okay Now we'll turn back a little bit so we can make sure we can get it all in. Okay. And we have it all in. Okay. Now the time t is the time that the protective device should operate in so that the conductor tem temperature does not rise to a level where damage occurs to the cable under short circuit conditions. Okay. That's what we're saying here. Here we have VS3036 semi enclosed fuses. Okay. And the VS3036 type of protective device are very simple yet very effective. Okay. Now, when current flow in the circuit, heat is given off. If the current is lower than the fuse rating, then the fuse can dissipate the heat into the surrounding air. If however, however the current greater than the heat rating of the fuse flows in the circuit, then the fuse will be unable to dissipate the heat as easily and the fuse element overheats. When the fuse wire reaches a set temperature, it will melt. This type of fuse is only good for currents up to 100 amps and voltages up to 250 volts. Okay. Advantages and disadvantages BS3036. Okay. Let me make sure we can get it all in. Okay. Okay, advantage no moving parts, cheap, melted element is easy to see low replacement cost, disadvantages, etc, etc, etc. And you can read this for yourself. You don't even need to be reading this to you at all. Okay. Now we're going so close so we can see it all. Okay. And let's pan out. Okay, good. Now, cartridge fuses. Let me just make sure I can get this up in to place. Cartridge fuses BS1361 and BS1362. Now, be aware for any changes in these references. Okay. Now BS 
1.61 carrier fuses are still found in distributors. Cutouts in domestic insulation also have now been superseded by BS883 fuse systems seat fuses. BS1362 fuses are common types of fuse and are found in plug tops and small control circuits. Okay, and again, I'll just move in so you can see, get a bit more information and you have no problem seeing the advantages and disadvantages, okay? And I'll pan out so we can see what this to be dealing with there. Okay, thank you. Okay. BS88 HBC HRC cartridge fuses. Okay, let me just make sure that I've got this down the way it should be on this screen. Okay, come on here. Right. And here we have a selection of fuses. Okay. Let's go up a bit. Make sure I have everything in place. Okay. Thank you. Okay, good. Now, although they have sometimes been called HBC, high, higher braking capacity fuses, have been designed to take into account the electromagnetic effects that occur when certain pieces of equipment are turned on. Okay. And again, let me just move go in. Okay, and your and this type of fuel is quite expensive and is commonly used in industry, which is correct. Okay, especially for overhead buzz barrels and so forth. Right, the HRC fuse labels. Rather than using fusing factor as a measure of the performance of the uh, protective device, the HRC fuse has three separate labels. G, common G, capital G, the general purpose, a braking capacity of at least 80 kiloamps at 415 volts AC at 0.2 power factor. The temperature rise of the fuse must not exceed 70 degrees Celsius when carrying the rated current. They must have the ability to protect PVC insulated cables from damage due to overload currents. GM these fuses are used for backup protection of motor circuits and are usually found in a smaller package. AM and that's common A capital M. These are a backup type fuse and are used for motor protection. They are based on a European standard and are similar to the GM fuse link. They do not provide overload protection and therefore have to be coordinated with other devices. Okay, now let's take this section by section. Okay. 
Okay, you need to read it for yourself. Okay. 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 <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, I'm good. Hopefully you can see this for yourselves now. Discrimination in BS88 fuses. Okay. Discrimination occurs only under certain conditions for this type of fuse. To be certain about discrimination, you can use the fuse manufacturer's bullrush diagrams. A bullrush, bullrush chart shows the pre arcing I squared T and the total I squared I squared T, excuse me. Okay. As long as the total time taken for a fuse to operate is lower than the pre arcing time of the next fuse size up in rating, then discrimination will occur. I squared T is a measure of the total energy that is let through on the fault conditions. The pre arcing time is the point at which the fuse begins to blow. It is essential that the lower rated fuse operates before the next fuse size up begins to arc. Pre arcing time. So, what they're saying here is that if I have two fuses, I have one at 30 amps and one at 20 amps. The 20 amp fuse must blow before the 30 amp fuse. Okay, if by chance the 30 the arcing is so so fast and so quick that it blows with the 30 amp fuse, then there should be another protective device. Okay. so you can see this for yourself and read it as well now make sure you read it because you need to extract the information from it note the regulations use the term selectivity in preference to discrimination okay but it, it both means the same thing discrimination okay and that is in respect of current and protective devices, not in any other means of references to any other means. And here are bullish curves. Okay. That's a bull rush graph. Amperes in seconds, and you can see the fuse rating. Right, this is just self explanatory, okay? Discrimination is achieved between the 6 amp and 10 amp fuses. So you have the 6 amp, the 6 amp should blow before, before the, the, the 10 amps, okay? Discrimination is not achieved between the 20 amp and the 25 amp fuses, okay? So you have 20 amps here, 25 amps. Now the chances are that 
if a fault occurs, the, it will bypass this and trip this. That fuse rating there is somewhat a bit low in comparison to this. So let's make sure that you have it in. You can see it in full. Go back in. Okay. Where the bulrush diagrams aren't available, it is good rule of thumb to apply a factor of 1.6 to the rating of the fuse to provide discrimination. Okay. To guarantee discrimination, a factor of 2 is better than 1.6. For example, a 10 amp fuse will provide discrimination for a 6 amp fuse. It being more than 1.6 times the rating of the 6 amp fuse. Okay. I'm just going to here for you, okay, so you can pick this up, okay. Discrimination in BS88 fuses, okay. And let's just get your head in for you in full, okay. Thank you. Okay. When you look at the graph in Appendix 3 of BS7671, you will notice that the time current characteristics for HRC fuses are cut off at 0.1 seconds. What happens when we get cut off times faster than 0.1 seconds? We need access to the manufacturer's data. Current rating pre arcing I squared T 21 amps. To the I squared T times A squared S at 415 volts 60. Now, this table shows the total energy let through for a variety of HRC fuses. Okay. And here you can see that 6 amps, 0 0.1 second lock rating. Okay. 20 amps will still operate in 0.1 second also. Now make sure you read the graph and you get familiar with, with it and look at the on-site guide and the IET regs to make sure you understand what it is trying to say. Okay. Advantages, disadvantages of HRC fuses. Okay. And I'm sorry, let me just go back a little bit. I can't remember if I took in that view. Completely, let me just go back a little bit. So now I took the same completely. Okay, I'm just pan back. Okay, everything is in view. So I couldn't remember whether or not everything was in view. It is now, thank you. Good.
Now here we are looking at advantages and disadvantages of the HRC fuses. HRC fuses range in volume from 2 amps up to 1,200 amps, which is quite a wide range. For very short disconnection times, you have to calculate the capability of the cable to withstand heat and compare it with the amount of energy that the fuse will allow to pass before it blows. Now you need to make sure the fuse passes minimum amount of energy before the fuse blows. So the fuse blows as quickly as possible, limiting the amount of energy that is being passed through. And this is BS60898 circuit breakers, okay? And I'm just going to, to here make sure that we can see it in full, okay? Okay. Okay, a circuit breaker has two means of tripping, magnetic and thermal. And you can see that our shutters, terminals, fixed contact, moving contacts, etc. Spring, plunger, latch mechanisms, and so forth, and how it is made up. Now, in a circuit breaker's normal state, the current flows and neither the bimetallic trip nor the bimetallic, nor the magnetic trips are affected. Sorry about that. I'm going to get my tongue untwisted. The latching mechanism is held in place and the plunger is low, not affecting the trip mechanism. Okay. Right, Up overload operation of circuit breakers, short circuit operation of circuit breakers. And that's what this shows you now, the relevant mechanism operation of each, okay, in turn. Okay. Now you should be able to read this for yourself. The overload has caused the bimetallic strip to heat up and move. In a short circuit, it is the mag magnetic part of the circuit that is affected that causes contacts to change and move into place. Okay, so let me just make sure we can get that into full view. Okay, okay. can do. Right, that's good, thank you. Now, advantages and disadvantages of circuit breakers. Okay, and here I'm just going to, you can read this for yourselves, you don't need me to be reading this for out to you, okay. I will go into it so you can make sure you can see the text, okay?
Now type the circuit breakers. Okay, and here we are. Let me just go back and make sure I've gone up a bit. Okay, yep. Okay. VS60898 states there are now three types, type B, type C, and type D. To pick a circuit breaker capable of handling large inductive circuits, it is necessary that you pick the either type C or D if it is to be SN60898. Here you can see more clearly that the magnetic part of the circuit breaker operates before 0.1 second. And this is where it operates. It begins to operate here in regards to the current flow and your time is on this side. So you can see here that it operates way before 0.1 second. And the appropriate current. Now the thermal element takes over for overload conditions and that starts where the large bend begins about halfway up the curve. And here you have your overload. And that's where your overload begins. Okay, the thermal begins to take effect. Now I'm just going to pan in here so you can see your graph in more detail, okay? Okay. Okay. Good. So let's find out, let's make sure we get everything in play now, okay? back into focus okay that is good okay okay thank you Now discrimination circuit breakers, sorry, discrimination in circuit breakers. Now I'm not going to go down into read this down for you in turn. The on-site guide gives you plenty of information and knowledge on this, the IET works also. So type B, type C, type D, rating, etc. amperes, all currently required for overload 1.45 times. So it's just giving you your factor you need to apply when you're trying to calculate current required for overload protection okay current range for instantaneous operation three to five times i to the n okay whatever the current count is now for each of the types of circuit breaker you can see the range of values that a circuit breaker can operate within Type B circuit breaker has a stated range of three to five times the rating of the device. Okay, so here you're looking at three to five times its value, its rating of the, the device, which will operate within that range. Okay, just go in, make sure that it's in frame. Okay, let me just make sure we can pick this up fully. Okay. Okay, 
Thank you. Let's come back, make sure we get everything in range. Okay, thank you. Okay, good. Right, labeling of circuit breakers, okay. And here we have that label of circuit breakers. And what we have here is all circuit breakers to BSN etc. will have a label stating a certain amount of information. And here you have one which tells you the information here already. Okay, manufacturer type etc. Breaking capacity etc. Okay. The label keys information is the type, the rate of current, the breaking capacity, etc. are also on this here. Okay, okay we'll just pan down so we can get this into place. Okay. Okay, make sure we get everything in, in view. Yes, everything is in view, good. And that is positioning of protective devices, okay. And here you can read this for yourselves, okay, so I was going close, so, so you can, there are certain conditions, etc, etc. Make sure you're familiar with this, okay. Now, discrimination let's get it, let's, between different types of protective devices. Okay, I'm just going to bring you into the table here. Okay, bring the tables up a little bit so you can see it important clearly.
again let me just bring this up discrimination between different types of protective devices again another chart Okay, I will bring this out completely. Okay, now what we have is a situation where the discrimination between two devices cannot be guaranteed, and we need to consider the coordination of the protective devices. Okay. You can see here that for your 40 amps or 32 amps, you've, you do have very rapid disconnection time of 0.1 second. Okay. And that's at a very high current prospective current aromatic amperes. So you can see here at the knee that it simply has dropped down. It's a, it has operated your protective devices. Again, check this. Make sure you understand the concept behind this. Look at your on-site guide. Look at the IE regs and look at what all the information has been provided by the HSC Health and Safety Executive because they give quite examples of this as well themselves on their website. So use the HSC website as well. Right, coordination. Okay. And let's just bring this into play so you can see it. And here, the braking capacity of each protective device shall be not less than the prospective short circuit current or earth fault current at the point at which the device is installed. Okay, now again, let's just make sure we get all this in. And that's for you to read yourselves, okay? Don't need me to be reading this out to you. Thank you, okay. Multi choice questions. Now, I would like you very much to do the questions, please, for me, okay? It helps to en enhance your understanding, okay?
Okay, thank you. That will be us for today. Thank you very much, okay? I shall all is well. Okay, take care, stay safe.